A lot of people have a misconception about what cider is in the first place. They think, all right, it's going to be sugary, it's going to be super sweet, I'm not going to like it. Uh, if I can teach my staff how to be enthusiastic in the knowledge that we have as cider industry people, I can train my customers to be just as passionate about it. And then they like go home and tell their friends about this crazy cider knowledge that they have. It helps a lot. Hello, my name is Rio Wincaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. Bringing us into this year, episode 360, was Katie Black talking about educating both barroom staff and consumers, which I think is one thing to really kind of consider, but I'm going to kind of hold that thought for now. I'll let her fill you in more on that. This was from a workshop presentation that she co-presented with Megan McLean. So you're going to be hearing from both these gals. And the title of the workshop is Tackling Tap Rooms. But I call this episode Tap Room tips because it is just slam packed with tips that you could take home today and start making your own assessment. Now, I know some listeners out there in Ciderville, like myself, may never have a tap room or a restaurant or a pub, but you are a discerning drinker. That I have a feeling is true because if you're listening to this here podcast, you probably, you know, maybe you drink your own cider like I do, but you probably also go out and about. And so this really kind of fills in some of the gaps for me when I'm going out, whether it is to a pub or a tasting room, or I'm going to an event. One thing that's really important to me is service. Those are the frontline workers who are who are, you know, chit-chatting with me, how they welcome me, uh, what they're doing while the event is taking place. For some reason, I don't know, I'm always like watching that. That is like a piece that is really important. And, And partly because at this point in my life, I am producing events. I just produced a huge event last November. We had, you know, the the Calvados tasting with Ambrosia Borowski. John Bunker was speaking about home orchard care. We had Lisa Laird Dunn talking about the history of Applejack. And then we had a, a cider pop-up and then a celebrating woman dinner. I mean, it was like a big action-packed weekend of events. And so hospitality was absolutely key. And this is a big piece of what you're going to be learning on this here episode, but a lot more to consider around design. So I just found it like super intriguing. And I know that they're just, you know, just touching the the tip of the iceberg here, which I hope will make you kind of like earmark this episode. If you are someone who is opening a taproom, maybe you already have one, or you're going to be like looking for some design tips. These two, these two gals are really like good folks to know. So you'll be hearing that presentation in just a wee bit. But first I have a bit of news from out and about. In Ciderville. Walk into the orchards. I have two little things taking place in North America. We're going to go to the U.S. first, specifically the Northeast. This came in my line of sight from someone who's been on the podcast, and that would be Alan Supernot. And he is going to be teaching a hands-on workshop on grafting apples. And that is going to be taking place on April 15th from 1 to 3 p.m. I think it's a nominal fee of like uh, 10 bucks. 10 bucks. Amazing. You get to bring a tree home. This guy has so much info. You might remember him on the podcast talking about Michael Phillips, who passed away way too young. Uh, a, a, an author who's really Im- impacted many, many listeners out there in Ciderville through his work in holistic orchard care. Well, Alan was a good friend and we had a chit chat around that. Anywho, so that's taking place at Brook Farm Orchard. I'll put a link in the show notes so you could contact Alan if you want to be able to attend that. I know that there's folks who are local who listen to this. And then I want to go up to Canada. This came from Lockmore Cider, which is in Prince Edward County in Ontario. And they kind of tagged me on this. I thought it was really cool. It is an amateur cider competition, and it's being held by the Canuck Cider Cup. 
and Canuck is spelled C-A-N-U-C-K. So it's CanuckCiderCup.ca. Again, I'll have a link in the show notes to that. The deadline to send in two of your bottles or cans, if you have them, if you're an amateur, maybe some people have them, cans, I don't know, is April 21st. So you have a little bit of time, and it's only an $8 fee, probably per cider, I would say. And the judging takes place in May. And this is the first time it kind of came, you know, across my attention here. And what's cool about it is, like, new competitions, and I'm figuring this is kind of a newish competition, makes it a great time to get involved. Because as they're working at the kinks and, you know, kind of getting the judging down, you can learn a whole lot and really be part of the narrative that's taking place in that region, in this case, Ontario, to help amateur makers like myself, maybe you too, keep on increasing your skills. So that's a Canuck Cider Cup, April 21st. And then I want to go over now to, well, across the pond, at least on my side of the country here, over to the UK. And uh, I've been following a bit of Albert Johnson, what he's doing over there, which is touring about and bringing kegs of cider to a whole bunch of different bars and pubs. And the cool thing about it is you could follow him on Instagram at Ross Cider or on Facebook via Ross on Y Cider and Perry Company, their page. So I'll have a link in the show notes for both of those sites. And you can see the full list of different bars that he's going to. So when this episode goes live on the 15th of March, 2023, he's going to be in Chester at that beer place. And, you know, yeah, he has a keg in his backpack. He's posting photos like that, which is so relatable, I have to say. I have carried... Well, like five gallon kegs, they they would do liters in uh, the UK. But you know, they're small small kegs. You know, just large enough to fit in a, a good sized backpack. And I've I've tooled about two, so very relatable. I love the whole idea. The revolution will not be pasteurized, and the revolution is all about cider. And then he ends up in Brussels, uh, the last stop on this tour, and that's going all the way through May. So he'll be in Brussels on May 24th at the cider bar there called Cidro Thie. You can look it up by following Ross Anwai Cider and Perry Company. When I come back, you're going to hear me talking about our sponsor. Sweet, crisp, fresh, or balanced, whatever the cider you want to make, you will find the right yeast for your favorite cider in the Saf Cider Range by Fermentis. This week, let's discover AB1 Saf Cider. AB1 stands for Apple Balance. This yeast is the right choice for balanced cider. It ensures a very good assimilation of fructose and excellent for low-gravity ciders which results in a delicate aroma profile combining fresh and elaborate fruit notes with a balanced mouthfeel respecting cider structure. Saf Cider AB1 will suit for all types of balanced ciders, even under difficult fermentation conditions. Want to explore diversity of cider profiles? Discover it through the selection of yeast strains visiting their website, fermentis.com. That's spelled F. E-R-M-E-T-I-S dot com. Up next is our featured presentation with Megan McLean and Katie Black. They're speaking at CiderCon 2023 in Chicago, and the workshop was titled Tackling Tap Rooms. They're going to be providing you a wide range of different topics to contemplate and consider and actually integrate into your work plan if you are a business owner. But if you're also a consumer, like I said earlier, I know you're going to be learning something too, because more than likely you are someone who invites others to join in and raise a glass. And if so, there's always a little bit of hospitality that one can learn whether you are in business or simply entertaining at home. So without further ado, I invite you to grab a glass and join this chat once again with Megan McLean and Katie Black. I am Katie Black. I have a very extensive background in a multitude of things in this industry. 
I actually started out home brewing, um, went into working in production full time after working front of house for a while. So my beginning of the industry was actually front of house managing and opening tap rooms for breweries. Um, through that, I fell in love even more so with the process of production and worked my way through to the back. Um, within COVID, kept doing consultations for openings, mostly in food and beverage, um, and then ended up uh, going into a program in Asheville, which is where I'm located, if you're familiar with Beer City. Uh, we've got a little bit of everything. So I went to school during COVID, which 10 out of 10 don't recommend, and got a associate's degree in brewing, distillation, and fermentation. From there, I actually, one of my classmates was a uh, Michael Jackson Foundation recipient and recommended a scholarship, which hopefully you've heard of at this point, uh, that was sponsored by ACA and Beer Culture, and then with a the sponsored cider as well. So Ancho Cider sponsored me to come here last year and learn all things about cider. Fantastic opportunity. I just sat for my palm exam in this exact room uh, two days ago. So <laughs> within that, met Megan and met the Artifacts crew, and they needed some help. So that is how we met. And then I am now back in production distilling at an Amaro company in Asheville, North Carolina. Kind of seen it all, done it all, um, and we'll kind of go into that more so of how my background specifically goes into tasting rooms, tap rooms, and atmosphere. I think it's really important to kind of have an extensive knowledge of multitudes of your industry. So yeah, that's a little bit about me and my background. I started in hospitality when I was 16. Uh, I did an unpaid pastry internship, wanted to learn how to bake stuff. Uh, never left, so been in it uh, going on 15 years now. Um, I was a server and a bartender for a long time. I did a little stint as a pastry chef. Uh, I ended up going to a tiny little liberal arts college and got a bachelor's degree in food justice and sustainability. So uh, tying things back into local food systems is really important to me, um, and I've, I've sort of done that throughout the course of my work. Um, I was lucky enough to start with Artifact Cider Project back in April of 2021, so I haven't been with the company very long, but um, feel very lucky to be a part of it. Uh, I was brought on to reopen our second tap room in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, it was built out, staffed up, and ready to open for April of 2020. You can guess how well that went. It did not go well. Uh, we were able to finally actually open our doors in October of 2020. We were only able to be open for about four to six weeks uh, and then had to close again due to COVID, due to waves, you know, health concerns, that kind of stuff. So I came on board in April of 2021, uh, rehired an entire team, reformed the kitchen concept, rebuilt the space, uh, purchased all new stuff, uh, sort of had to do like a, a full overhaul. So I'm no stranger to putting systems together and I'm really excited to tell you guys sort of about our process and how we've done it. Um, we reopened our flagship tap room together uh, in uh, May 2022. Yeah. <laughs> Feels <laughs> like a, a lifetime ago. <laughs> um, so, and it was really just the two of us out in Western Mass, you know, did, did a similar thing, rehired the, the whole staff rebuilt all the programs, uh, sort of brought new life and, and a new concept and new structure to a tap room that had been around since 2018. So we're gonna talk to you not only about opening a new tap room and like diving into that world for the first time, but also how to sort of revamp and, and reinvigorate your existing tap room and your existing concept. One of the things that sort of came across to us as most important when we were putting this presentation together was a focus on brand identity. So. Katie and I have this thing where we, we <laughs> anytime we walk into a bar, we see all the problems with that bar right away, right? We're very operational minded. Uh, if something's not working, if there's a system that seems out of place, if the lighting is weird, there are so many things that tie into your brand's identity that people don't really think about when they're putting together a tap room, especially people who haven't been in hospitality for a very long time, right? So with our extensive backgrounds in hospitality, we wanted to kind of go over the little details that really make it feel like your space actually ties into the brand that you want to get across to people, right? Because at the end of the day, we're all in this to like connect with the consumer, right? We want to sell our product, we want people to enjoy the product, and we want to educate them. And so our staffs and our tap rooms act as sort of a liaison between the producer and the outside world. We're going to sort of go over like a, a four-pronged approach to introducing elements of your brand identity into your space. So the first thing that I'm gonna talk about um, is design. And Katie's gonna talk a little bit about this more in depth later. First things first, bare bones, the space. Consider how you want your space to feel when it's completely empty. 
There are going to be nights where you don't have anyone in the tap room. It happens to all of us. We've all been there. There are going to be nights when you're at capacity or over capacity. There are going to be nights when it feels totally crazy. When you're choosing a space and when you're designing a space, you really want to see how it feels on both ends of that spectrum, right? So on a slow night, you want it to feel just as inviting and welcoming as it feels on a packed, busy night. Um, my tap room in Cambridge, when it's empty, doesn't feel much like a bar. Uh, the lighting might be a little too bright. There might be some things that make it feel a little bit too clean for people. So we've done a lot of work to sort of uh, redo the environment when it's you know a, a slower night and make it a little bit more welcoming and inviting for people. Um, consider how it will look, feel, and function when you're at capacity. Is there flow? Does your staff have room to work? Do your guests have access to the bathroom when there's a line at the bar? Or do they have to like go around an entire blockade of people? Consider how you want to factor in accessibility, both for disability, um, for people with any sort of neurodivergencies. Generally speaking, high ceilings are going to require high top seating. It's an issue that we ran into. So we actually don't have any dining room table level seating. And that's been an issue that we've run into. So these are all things that you just need to keep in mind when you're building out and designing a space. Small elements really come into play when you're considering glassware, lighting, artwork, bathroom design, furniture, all this stuff. I encourage you to test out absolutely everything that's going into your tap room. Drink out of the glasses, eat off the plates if you're providing food. Uh, sit in the lighting and see how the lighting feels at all different times of the day, right? Our tap room is open from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, and then on the weekends, we're open 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. So the lighting drastically changes throughout the day. And we had to program different lighting during different times of the day to make sure that it really felt comfortable all the time. Um, how cozy do you want the space to feel? If it's too cozy, you're going to have some campers. You're going to have people who overstay their welcome. We've all seen it. Um, if it's not cozy enough, people are not going to stick around for another round. They're not going to spend more money. So you really want to strike a balance between being a comfortable, welcoming space and not being like somebody's living room, right? I have myself overstayed my welcome at bars that have couches because they're really comfy. Pro tip, try out your furniture before you buy it. Uh, if it's not comfortable, there's no point, and furniture is expensive, so it's not something that you want to have to reinvest in um, a year, two years, three years down the road. Lighting is one of the most important elements. You guys will notice when you came in that we did have the lights dimmed. Uh, the only reason that they're up like this right now is because we're being recorded. So lighting plays a huge, huge, huge role in atmosphere and environment. Um, I myself will not go into a bar that is too bright. I just won't do it. It feels like a cafeteria. It doesn't feel fun. Uh, if it's too bright and you can see everyone's faces in detail, what's the point, right? Your sound system is really important. And this is a detail that gets really lost in the shuffle sometimes. You want to have a sound system that's adaptable, a sound system that delivers great quality and something that you can use for all occasions. So you want your sound system to be, to be able to handle a busy Saturday night service as well as you know a quiet Sunday afternoon. You want it to be subtle enough and have good enough sound quality that when it's super slow in there, you can play some jams and get people excited. Uh, you can play some lo-fi. And then on the weekends, you can like rage, right? Late night, Saturday night, loud music. You want a system that can handle that, doesn't blow out your speakers, that kind of thing. Um, everything in your tap room should be adjustable. Your lighting, your sound, your furniture, you should be able to move every element around and readjust it in a bunch of different formats for different occasions. Uh, atmosphere is really the thing that we want to focus on when we're designing and building out a space. Um, the last thing that I'm going to touch on here is virtual presence. So a lot of us work for really small companies. We don't necessarily have the budget for a marketing team or have a graphic designer to do our website. Your virtual presence, your Instagram, your Facebook page, your website should really reflect the identity that you're trying to get across in your tap room. So the colors should be similar. It should feel like a similar vibe. Uh, you should have introductions for your staff on there so that people know what to expect when they're coming into your space. It should feel as consistent as possible with the identity that you're trying to get across. So the physical feel and design of your space should be reflected in your online presence across all of your platforms. So your website, your online menu, your online ordering page, your social media, uh, consistency in language is really important. So when I respond to reviews, uh, which is a big part of my job, 
Um, I have uh, templates that I use. So I always want to be using similar language. Um, I don't ever use negative language when I respond to reviews uh, because the whole vibe that we've built at Artifact is very positive and welcoming. And so even if there's a review that I really don't like, I'm never going to be negative about it, right? Because I am reflecting the identity of the brand. Culture is sort of my favorite thing to talk about. So I started with Artifact as a general manager. It was my first general manager position ever, and I was by myself. It was really up to me, and I'm you know, so glad that they trusted me with this, but it was really up to me to define the culture um, and make sure that the brand new team that I was bringing together really meshed well together, were able to figure out uh, sort of what our brand was about and make sure that everyone worked well together at the end of the day. So there are three factors that I've come across that I think are the most important when considering building a culture. First and foremost is transparency. Um, you want to define your vision. Figure out what your company's mission and values are, which is something that you should have if you're starting a company, right? Everyone has a mission statement when they start a company. So define what that is in terms of hospitality. Make it clear to every single person on your team, from dishwashers to general managers. Everyone should know why they're there, what the purpose of their role is, um, and what their place in the company is like. Consistency is hugely important. Uh, doing things that you say you're going to do. It sounds basic, but when you are managing a company and you're running around like crazy, there are going to be things that fall through the cracks. This is something that I've really had to work on in the last couple of years. Just being authentic, showing up as your true self, and making sure that everyone who works with you knows who you are and doesn't ever have to doubt that you are being honest or transparent with them. Uh, consistency is huge. Um, teamwork is, is the last element of this that I'm going to touch on. So uh, we are big into cross-training, um, and I've, I've always been this way throughout my career. I think that Everyone who, who works with me should be able to do every position in our, in our tap room. We have front of house people who do kitchen shifts to try it out. We have chefs who come behind the bar. Uh, there's no barriers to access in our company. So, uh, you know, we promote from within. We're very clear about the expectations that are set in order to move up in the company. Things like, you know, cross training days where you literally swap front and back of house and have them work a shift. You'd be shocked how much they learn. <laughs> Team building exercises, competitions, games. Uh, we're going to touch on this when we go into training a little bit. But the really one of the best ways to get your staff engaged is to give them a little friendly competition. Give them something to work for, you know? Make it fun. Make it a game. I love Jeopardy as a staff game. It's like everyone gets really into it. It gets really competitive. It's great. I'm going to just circle back to transparency for a moment because this is something that's just really important to me. Share the things that you can. Um, small omissions, white lies, tiny betrayals of trust tend to snowball over time. Trust, building trust is, is absolutely crucial to building a healthy culture, especially in a restaurant. Like I said earlier, make your expectations clear. Define clear roles and job descriptions before you hire for them. If you put up a job posting that doesn't have an extensive job description, you're not going to get the person that you're looking for. It's just not going to happen. Think about what kind of energy and personalities will work best with your own and with your existing team and factor that into your structure. Big thing for me is teamwork. So, you know, a lot of uh, career hospitality professionals, myself included, have had ego problems at one point or another. We all know sort of the, the chef stereotype. I am big on leaving egos at the door. So I consider our lowest paid employee to be just as important as our highest paid employee. Making that clear to your team that everyone is equally valued and has an equal stake in the company, metaphorically speaking, uh, is, is really important. Uh, mutual respect is really the only way to build a lasting and resilient team. And to kind of touch on that too, as someone who has worked multi, like multi areas of this uh, industry, and been fortunate too. It's not always been the easiest. Um, I've had the best experiences from a lower position, essentially, working for people who were not afraid to dive in. Like if I'm in the weeds and my manager or my owner or my cider maker who has no idea what's going on is willing to jump in and just ask, how can I help? It, it goes such a long way and it might sometimes feel like you're out of place or maybe you don't want to overstep into somebody's territory, but I promise you, the effort tenfold is always appreciated. And I don't think people talk about that a lot because it is a little 
out of the norm. So people, um, this is a huge one, kind of going back and forth. Uh, when I went to Artifact last year, for example, we talked about working together. So like working with another person, trying to figure out where your similarities were, where our differences were. We both had the same idea when it came to hiring. I can teach somebody how to build an extensive cocktail. I can teach somebody how to serve a table. What I'm never gonna be able to teach somebody is passion about my product. If you don't have somebody standing in your company that actually believes in your product, that stands behind it, it changes everything. It is one of the, <laughs> the biggest turnoffs for me as a consumer is going to a bar and hearing a bartender say, well, I don't like anything that we have. You may not like everything that somebody offers, but I need you to at least understand the passion and the beauty behind it. Um, so that's, that's, a huge, that's a huge one for me. Um, and I will absolutely ask if somebody is familiar with cider, for example. Um, if they were not familiar with cider, which we will talk about as well going into in our training, we actually give you all the tools. I think that is also a lack with the people that you have in your company is maybe we're not providing all of the tools that we can for them. So we will also touch on that as well because I think that expecting somebody to know how our brains work is never, it's not going to happen. I don't even <laughs> understand how my brain works sometimes. So <laughs> kind of the three elements that we wanted to touch on here, the, the three things that I tend to look for when I'm hiring and keep in mind, like we're hiring at a very entry level. So we're not, this is not a template for hiring management. This is not a template for hiring director level positions. This is for servers and bartenders. This is when you're sort of staffing out your tap room. Um, we look for passion, as Katie said. So, you know, uh, steps of service can be taught. POS systems can be taught, cleaning procedures, all that stuff that can be taught. That true innate sense of hospitality and passion can't really be taught. So we would rather hire people who are extremely green, but really excited to be there and excited to learn and can leave their egos at the door than hire somebody who might be, you know, super experienced, but brings a bad attitude to the team or doesn't really care about the product. Um, if your guests or if your team is excited about your product, your guests are going to be so excited about your product. It is contagious. Yeah, the enthusiasm for learning is important. Uh, I did not work in cider before a year ago, honestly, actually. CiderCon was the first time I'd been here. And the passion that is within this industry inspired me to now come back and bring my tools in from other parts of the industry. There's something so beautiful about this product. I mean, as we all know, apples speak for themselves. It's not like beer. I can bring in apple juice and I can just intensify everything that that apple did. We all have different states that have different varietals. There's a lot in there. And a lot of people have a misconception about what cider is in the first place. They think, all right, it's going to be sugary. It's going to be super sweet. I'm not going to like it. Uh, if I can teach my staff how to be enthusiastic in the knowledge that we have as cider industry people, I can train my customers to be just as passionate about it. And then they like go home and tell their friends about this crazy cider knowledge that they have. It helps a lot. And team spirit and mutual respect also runs into that. That is a very important aspect of what your tasting room or your tap room is going to be. And I think it's absolutely important because the people that you hire and the people that are showing up to be the face of your brand are going to be your biggest brand ambassadors on top of anybody else that works for you. So it helps a lot. <laughs> so I just wanted to talk for a second about the importance of your product. You're all here because you know quality product. You produce it, you market it, or you support the, uh, the efforts of great cider makers. Excellence is a great place to start. Consistency and excellence is key. Train your staff from day one. They should know the product inside and out. They should know how it is supposed to look, smell, and taste. They should be able to spot flaws and react accordingly. And they should trust that mentioning this to management is going to be well-received and acted on. If they're wrong, at least you know they're paying attention and that they're not afraid to speak up, which is huge. As a customer, if I go into a bar, uh, a brewery, wherever, and I discover a fault in the product that I'm drinking, if I bring that up to a team member and their response is to tell me that I'm wrong or they didn't notice, I'm never coming back to that bar. It, it happens all the time. We get, a, we get a bad keg. We get a bad batch. It happens. There are flaws. It's okay. Allowing your team, like empowering them to be able to notice those things, give them the knowledge to be able to say, this tastes off. I might not know why, but I know that this is not what it's supposed to taste like, and I'm going to bring this up. 
your guest experience is going to be 10 times better and your staff is going to be able to trust themselves and trust you more. We're going to kind of talk about the timeline of a tasting room and then go into recruiting systems and training, which is going to essentially, this is the order that we recommend things go in. Um, and we'll kind of explain why this is the way that we've at least tried to, to do this. If you've ever opened a business in any capacity or known someone who's opened a business, uh, timelines kind of get tossed out the window. Coding doesn't always work out. Maybe your staffing completely falls through. You know, it's the wild, wild west. So this is kind of how we want to go with it. Uh, but honestly, just being optimistic and being open to uh, the snowball effect that is an opening is, is the best way to, to go about it. Um, and even if you have a plan and it falls apart, at least you have a plan and you kind <laughs> of know what to do next, right? The biggest thing I learned on top of everything we're going to talk about is if you don't, if it's not your strong suit, if you don't know how to do something, the best thing that you can do is put the money forward and hire somebody who does. It's going to save you so much trouble down the road. If you don't know how to operate a bar, probably should hire somebody who at least has had experience doing that to get you through that opening. Um, accounting, financing, which I'm sure we've actually, I know we've had other classes kind of go through that, but all of these components really do make a huge difference in the longevity of your entire company. Conceptual build out. There's a lot of questions that I would like and challenge you to think about whether you have an existing space or not. Is it a satellite space? Are you connected to your production facility? The difference in that, which we both had with Artifact, um, night and day experiences for our consumers. Our brands had to match, but our atmosphere was completely different. How many of you guys have floor drains behind your bar or somewhere that you can actually clean the flooring? Because that is missed a lot. One. I know that depending on uh, your building, you may not have access to that, but I do recommend uh, whether it's flooring or procedure that you're able to actually clean because it is the one place that everyone misses behind a bar specifically um, or even in the tap room. Flooring and cleaning it is going to be noticed more than people would ever like to talk about. It's not sexy, but it's very important. <laughs> if you take away one thing from this class, put in a floor drain. <laughs> Another question with your design. I'm kind of starting from the bottom just so you know and working your way up to, to opening this bar. A lot of people don't and a lot of people don't expect to expands their company as fast as they do. I think it's one of the coolest things to experience is somebody saying, hey, I opened a year ago, especially during COVID, and now we're at capacity six months later, and I don't have room for glassware. I don't have space for people to sit. I do challenge you to think about that because it could happen overnight at any point in time. And if you have the means to be able to grow later, uh, I always recommend to think about that in your design. You know, are you wanting to have multiple locations later? All of these things tie back into that brand because if you do something that you want to create again later, it will help when you're ordering, when you're thinking about glassware, uh, trying to do two tap rooms that were two hours apart. It's a lot of challenges. So it's always good to kind of have that five-year plan down the road because a lot of people aren't, you're thinking about opening, you're thinking about money, revenue, how am I going to process this back? And then bam, tap room happens. So another thing that gets missed a lot, your draft systems. Okay. Katie's very passionate about <laughs> draft systems, y'all. <laughs> As a producer, this is a huge one. If you've ever worked with one, if you've had a foamy keg, if you've had your CO2 go out, uh, if your glycol system, if you work with glycol goes out, the further away you are from that tap to your keg, the more problems you have. And sometimes with design, you're not going to have a way around that. So you have to think about your walk-in if you have one. Some people don't. You have to think about, are you going to have a bright tank? So if you have a serving tank, how far away is that going to be? Are you going to have a direct draw system? Is it just going to be directly under the counter? All of these have to be designed in a way that actually, <laughs> I notice, aren't functionally able to clean. If I can't pull my drain out and go ahead and clean my taps at the same time, a lot of things are built for aesthetics. I'm not a fan of aesthetics in a lot of ways um, for this, this reason. I think there's a way around it, but I think that always comes second. The further away you are, it's going to cost you more money the further away you are. So I, if you have a way to have that accessible for your bartenders too, because the further away your product is, the longer it's going to take them to walk away and come back. Um, so we're always thinking about efficiency when it comes down to it. Another big thing behind your bar, sink or dishwasher. 
try sinks are great if you have a bartender who knows how to properly use them. If the health department comes in and that's not getting done well, you're going to get dinged pretty hard. Dishwashers are pretty great at this point because the decibel levels with the sound of it are, are fairly good for behind a bar. Uh, it will help with time and efficiency. So if you do have the means to be able to afford to get a dishwasher behind a bar, I typically recommend it because it is going to save you a lot of trouble. You probably won't have as much glass broken. Overall, I just recommend dishwasher over sink. Same thing with ice, too. Uh, that's a big thing. I've worked in both places that had ice makers and some that didn't. So all of these things we don't think about. Where is that going to go? Is it going to be near your glass area? Speaking of glasses, do you want to polish your glasses for your cider? We recommend it. We do it. But you do need an area to polish. So you have to always think about your surface levels, um, how your bar is going to go. If your staff is expected to use the bar to build out the cocktails and polish the glassware, I would recommend expanding that bar out further if you're going to have people sitting at it. Uh, a lot of people will make a really slender bar. So you're kind of on top of your customers when you're doing things. Cocktails. If any, has anyone worked with cider cocktails before? So that's a great, it's a great thing. We've done it as well. I recommend it. People think it's extremely fun, and it's a good way to expand your program for your drinks. Uh, but with that, refrigeration comes, in, comes into mind. So whether you have to-go drinks behind, you have a refrigerator for your products, those need to be accessible. But if I had my perfect bar, I would always have under uh, refrigeration with shelving on top. Um, you can make that into your polish area. You can make that into your build area. Then you're not dealing with your bar. It is a little difficult in some places to get those. But they are definitely make the difference. Uh, so you have a multifunctional area. The flow behind the bar, too. When you're building that out, as we said before, with crowding. When you're thinking about standing behind a bar, have you guys ever been to a place where you're walking around and you have no idea where to order. You don't know where the line starts. You don't know where it ends. You don't actually know if you can even stand up, if that's a service area for the servers. Those things should be pretty clear because it will actually get more people to come get a drink. The minute I have to question where I'm going, I might be like, screw this. I'm leaving. I'm going to just go next door. And if I can butt in for a second. Yeah. Efficiency is money, right? <laughs> the faster someone can order a drink, the faster that bartender can make that drink, the more money is going in your pocket. It is a huge thing. And I think there's a beauty insider because most people are wanting to hang out and sit down and have a beverage. So all of these things when designing your bar is super important. Your bathrooms too. <laughs> so those get lost. Most coding in most buildings, you have to have two bathrooms. Um, please have them match in some capacity. More <laughs> More in the sense of the vibe. Yeah. Um, I really think that your bathroom, and I will stand by it, um, is also a re direct reflection of your brand. If I'm leaving the main space and I go into another area, whether it's the bathroom, another room, a patio, I don't want to feel like I left the room that I was just in. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. I have worked in uh, all four varieties of food options in tasting rooms and tap rooms. Depending on the state, your legalities change for whether you're required to provide food. Where I'm at in North Carolina, if I do not provide food, whether that be as simple as chips or peanuts behind the bar, I have to then provide a private membership program. If you don't know your, your local laws when it comes to food and beverage, I would recommend tomorrow to look that up. It is very important. There's a couple different approaches. So like I said, the snacks, it's a simple one doesn't require any energy from your bartenders or you really at the end of the day, but it is nice to provide a snack for somebody because they may stay for an extra drink rather than leaving to go get, get it somewhere else. In-house residency. Some places you might have another entity come in and rent out space, which we have worked with before um, to provide food. Typically that'll be an overhead where you'll charge them for that. They'll pay rent and then you'll split profit. Catering style. I'm a big food truck person. Having worked in all these atmospheres, food trucks are great. It is simple. It is not something you have to worry about. It's clean. <laughs> yeah, and it comes and it goes. And restaurants. If they're executed, executed really well, they're fantastic. But having opened an extensive restaurant-style tasting room, there's a lot of pros and cons that come with that that you don't get to walk away from. I don't want to discourage anybody from doing that, but I do want to say the minute that you bring a full restaurant into your tasting room, the minute your entire thought process changes. Your food's going to become the priority 
90% of the time because a lot of people are now coming to eat with getting a, getting a cider, getting a beverage. It is a great way to market your stuff, but your entire mentality will then change from your consumer side. I'm going to talk about Mimi's real quick. Yeah, go for it. So uh, we had a bit of an adventure uh, at this tap room that I, I manage right now. Uh, when I was first sort of putting it together, we were thinking we were going to do food in house. We have a really, really small, like hundred square foot kitchen space. It doesn't have a hood, so we can't do anything with grease or uh, open flame. So it was a little bit of a challenge. We came up with what we thought was a really great concept. We were going to do gourmet sandwiches, make them super fun, have them be really cheap, but amazing quality sandwiches and cider seems like a born pairing, right? Uh, we had so many issues working within that kitchen space and not having a professional chef attached to it that for about a three-month period, I was the GM and the chef. Uh, as you can imagine, that did not go well. So uh, we came up with a pretty creative solution. Uh, I had some friends of mine that were doing pop-ups all around town. They had done a couple of pop-ups with us, uh, and I asked them if they wanted to stay. So we went from having a really inconsistent uh, and, and hard to deliver food product that was costing us a lot of money to having a five-year contract with a uh, Best of Boston winning uh, pop-up that is actually going to stay with us permanently. So really exciting development there, but I will just say like the amount of time, work, money, and stress that went into trying to figure out our own concept when we could have, you know, asked somebody to come in and do that concept for us from the beginning is kind of a prime example of putting money up front to save yourselves in the long run. Um, I'm a huge advocate for that. Like Katie was saying earlier, if you don't know how to do something or if you don't have time to learn how to do it, paying someone else to do it is your best bet, hands down. Like I said, I, I never want to discourage anybody, but it is something that I think is a huge choice to make. Do you have this space to do that too? I've worked in places where the execution expectation was so much more than we could have ever done just because we didn't have a way to expand or deliver it in the quality that I would have wanted to deliver it. And you also have to think about staffing too. So the more intricate your food situation is, the more employees you're going to need and your permits, which is my last little nerdy moment for you guys. This one's huge and not the most interesting, but it is your legalities. Going into alcohol, most states, you can't serve a lot of the things um, if you don't produce it or you don't hold the correct licensing for that. Um, that gets missed a lot depending on how often your local and state authorities are checking you. Um, but it's a huge fine. It can shut down your production facility. So I do urge you to make sure you understand your legalities for that. Food serving certifications with your local health department, depending on what you're offering. Uh, is somebody CPR certified? Do you have um, any alcohol training for your staff? One of the biggest things that I'm a stickler on is making sure that my staff knows how to check an ID. A lot of people don't know how to check IDs properly. And we have 50 states, military IDs, and passports to check. If you're ever in question on how to do that or how to provide the correct training for that for your staff, I would just reach out to your local ALE officer. I would also recommend to get in good with your ALE officer. They're pretty nice, and they're a lot more understanding when you're willing to work with them and also provide that training. They're seeing that you're trying to do the best you can for your staff and your community, and um, I've realized that's a great tool to have in your pocket. Farmers Brew is licensing. Wine and cider tend to sit more in most states on the same legalities as far as that goes versus beer. Um, as many of you know, the FDA and the TTB do look at cider depending on ABV differently. So your licensing does change uh, whether it's a fortified wine or a cider. Um, and a lot of distributors may be needed for things. So where I'm at, I'm running a bar in my production facility, but I am not allowed to use vermouth uh, unless I get it from a distributor. I can't sell beer unless I get it from my distributor. Uh, so those are all things that I do encourage you to make sure that at least you're aware of. Zoning. So depending on if you rent your space or you buy it, your zoning is going to change too. Um, and that's going to change a lot of your ordinances. So noise ordinance. Who are your neighbors? What is going on? Do you have a decibel reader? Do you stay open late? Your light ordinance is a big one too. Um, 
depending on where you're at. And as I had mentioned before, ABC laws, state and federal, um, I recommend you just to check them out uh, and making sure that staff is trained. Because at the end of the day, if your staff knows the rights in which they have, whether it's as a bartender, as an employee for your product, it might save you in the long run. Um, and I think it's of most importance. So. so recruiting, this is essentially going to be different depending on where you're at. Are you looking through internet leads? Are you paying somebody? Uh, do you have LinkedIn? Indeed, are you doing word of mouth, bulletin boards? I have noticed living around the country that that's going to vary for everybody depending on what works. I do prefer Indeed. I think a lot of people check it at this point. Um, and it's, it gives you a really good concise layout to fill out. It doesn't require a lot of work from you. It's kind of fill in the blank, come through. It sets up all of your video interviews. It sets up uh, whether or not that's going anywhere, sends out emails for you. Um, so that's kind of been a big thing. What to look for would have been, like we said, familiar with your product, passion for cider, um, willing and eagerness to learn. Cider is going to continue to evolve and we have to redirect the common misconceptions and what people have thought cider was before at the end of the day. Um, it's our job to send the knowledge on in any capacity that we can. I think that's why we both love doing what we do and being able to provide those tools as mentioned before, is going to be the best thing that you can do when it comes to recruiting as well. Being concise, being clear, and really looking for somebody that embodies what your brand is. Um, a personal choice of mine when I look at hiring is to hire individuals who are not the same. Um, it kind of stumps them up sometimes. Uh, but overall, I think having different people with different strengths makes the best teams possible. If I have three of the same personalities working behind that bar, they might get along but it might not be what's best for your service at the time. So I, I do encourage you to really open your, open your mind on the personalities and the strengths that you're bringing in. Um, one of my favorite questions as well as Megan's when we interview is asking also in management and ownership what we can do, what's a personal goal of yours. You know, at the end of the day, we are working together, but I spend more time with the people I work with than I do with anyone else in my life. If I, in my position, can help you grow as an individual or help you with some kind of weakness that you have, the hospitality industry carries straight over into personal life. Um, and I think that also opens up a lot of conversation with, with what you're going to get and who you're looking at. Thank you, Katie, for the intro on recruiting. As she mentioned, I think the method of recruiting really depends on the location that you're in. I've worked in a lot of different neighborhoods in Boston, and I've actually found that each neighborhood has, and, and each facet of the industry kind of has its own method that works best. So when I ran a craft cocktail bar, uh, Indeed actually was not the place to look for candidates, right? It was word of mouth. It was a website called Boston Chefs that posts uh, industry cocktail uh, jobs, stuff like that. For Artifact, the best thing that worked for us was Indeed, which shocked me. But it really is a matter of like doing the research about where people in your town are pulling their candidate pool and then actually going through, taking the time and going through every single candidate who applies to the role. I never like to dismiss somebody based on a resume. You know, if I see a red flag in, in behavior, sure, I'll dismiss. But I tend to interview everyone who applies. Uh, when we reopened the Western Mass location, we got uh, about 150 applicants over the course of a few months. Uh, we were hiring two and a half, three. So we interviewed over 100 people. It really gave us a sense of what we were looking for. Uh, and it also allowed us to connect to the community in a way that we weren't really expecting. So it was really cool. It's, it's a lot of work. You know, I recommend having somebody in place who has the time and energy and, and really like the gut instinct to know what to look for in a candidate. But I'm just going to give you some of the tips that I use because recruiting is kind of a weird superpower of mine that I've discovered in the last few years. I know within 30 seconds of talking to somebody if I want to hire that person or not. And I'm usually right. I mean, she hired me, so... <laughs> My interview process that I use uh, was developed during COVID, so keep that in mind. You know, it may change down the road once vir I don't know if virtual interviewing is here to stay. I think it is. It's so easy, right? Why wouldn't we do it? The first interview that I do is always virtual. It wastes less time if it's not a good match. 
All you have to do is hang up and go about your day. You don't have to leave. You don't have to kick somebody out. Really important to have that first interaction be really, really low stakes for you and for the candidate. The first 15 to 20 minute interview, you're really just getting to know them. I always ask the same questions. I ask them how their day's going. I like to loosen them up a little bit. I like to make a couple of jokes. I know it's, it's cheesy, but it works because you're not going to see someone's real personality until they're not nervous anymore, right? Uh, so I like to make them comfy. I like to ask them what their hobbies are. I like to know what their uh, five-year plan is if they have one and sort of what career they're interested in pursuing. Even if they're applying for a part-time bartender role, like Katie was saying, that doesn't mean that we can't help them along in aspects of personal and professional growth in their time with us. Like I said, I'm really big on trusting my gut. So if I get a sense that someone is not a good fit, I have to trust that, right? I put together the team in the first place. Or, you know, if, if you have somebody who maybe didn't put together the original team but was part of the original team or meshes really well with the original team, um, trust the, the people who have a sense of your culture in its truest form and who can really tell if the person that you're interviewing is going to be a good fit for that culture. Um, I follow up with everyone. So if someone's not a good match, I will tell them. I'm not a fan of ghosting people. I've been ghosted so many times in interview processes and it's, it's insulting, honestly. So I encourage you, even though it takes time to send a one line email saying, thank you for your time. It's not a good fit. Best of luck in your search. It goes a really long way. Uh, it makes people speak really positively about your company in the recruiting world. Uh, when people are looking for jobs, they might say, you know, I didn't get this job, but I had a really great experience with this interviewer. You should go apply. Um, and word of mouth for jobs like this is not the best way to get the job description out there, but is really important in sort of establishing and maintaining your company's reputation in the community. I keep my initial interviews short and sweet. Like I said, 15 to 20 minutes. I get to know them. I get to know their goals. I do tell them a fair amount about the position and make sure that it sounds like what they're looking for, because at the end of the day, it has to be a really good match for both you and the person that you're interviewing. Um, I, if I am considering hiring someone, I must have an in-person interaction with them. Uh, I have to have a second interview in person or I have to see them working with my team. Even just meet, having the person that you're interviewing meeting a member of your team to see how they interact is kind of crucial. Um, you're not going to know how they function in the space until they're in that space. So if you're opening a new tap room, that's going to be really hard because you don't have a physical space necessarily in which to interview people or to train people. You don't necessarily have a team in place that you can have them meet. Uh, I would still encourage you, take them out for coffee. Do something in person to get a sense of who they are and how they interact with the world around them because that's going to tell you a lot about how they handle hospitality going forward. I also sort of, this is very unofficial, but I, I like to keep an eye on new hires for a couple of months. I check in with them pretty consistently and I make sure that they're performing to the standard that we've set. Backtracking a little bit to something we talked about earlier, that's only possible if you set clear expectations from the beginning. So having a clear job description, like letting them know what is expected of them every day and then giving them benchmarks to say, you are performing well and here's why. And they know that they're performing well or they know that they're not performing well based on the expectations that you set for them in the beginning. Don't be afraid to let people go if it's not working. It's happened to, I mean, I've, I've been let go. It's happened. It wasn't a good fit. It was great for me at the end of the day. Like, don't be afraid to make changes that may seem difficult in the moment, but in the long term are going to help your, your team be healthier and more productive in the long run. You want to talk about this one? System design. This is also something that I typically will come in and do. I'm um, currently doing right now again. I am a big bar Bible human. I don't know if any of you guys have worked behind a bar. I hope you've had a bar Bible. I'm the kind of person, if you come ask me a question, I'm going to ask you if you tried to figure it out first. Not because I don't want to help you, but because I think empowering your staff to have the knowledge is most important. So a lot of things that I have in my little go-to cheat area, um, it's going to have all of your drink 
uh, information. So all of your random you know, stats on your ciders, your ABV, um, maybe some allergens, which is a huge thing uh, that people don't typically talk about. Do you have any allergens that might be in there? Um, do you have frequently asked questions, uh, information about your cidery? What year did you guys open? Um, what is your mission? What, what are you trying to do? Um, I have contact information for everybody in the company. If I'm not there and you can't get a hold of me, I need you to get a hold of somebody else, and I don't ever want you to feel like you're stuck. It stays in the same place all the time. Lay out exactly how you want your bar to be opened, how you want your bar to be closed down. It's slow. I have a side worksheet in there for you to do. If there's not something that you can do day to day, maybe we need to deep clean something. All of those systems will help alleviate a lot of headaches that your team has with each other, and it will also alleviate a lot of cleaning and monthly duties that you might have to do. So just a little bit of work every day really does make everyone's life a lot better. A big thing too that we both did, I worked on the floor every day for the first three months that we opened from open to close. Again, showing up for your team and being there, but also understanding, do my systems work? I have an open door policy with that. If something that I said I needed you to do is not working, please tell me because at the end of the day, I won't be back here in a month. This is a bar that you're going to work in day in and day out, and I want it to feel like you can actually do that in the confinement that you have. Your systems are going to change pretty frequently. Our opening checklist has changed uh, pretty much every two months since we opened uh, almost two years ago. Uh, it's based on seasonal needs. It's based on whether we have the patio open. It's based on how many staff members we have at any given time. It's based on a lot of things. So keep it fresh. Keep in mind that just because you wrote a checklist two months ago doesn't mean that that checklist is still going to be working. Listen to your staff when they tell you what they need. Yes. Wow. Did you get a lot of tips in there or what? Because I know I was taking notes the whole time I was listening to this episode. And it is just packed full of informational things that I never thought about before. I, I love the quote. Everything in the tap room should be adjustable where you're like thinking for the future. And I have seen that so many times where a new business with a tap room will open and they haven't really been setting up for the long term. And I've also been behind the bar where there is no drain, there is no dishwashing, it's just a total mess back there. And that just clogs the system of delivery to the patrons. And that's, you know, you could work around that, but it's kind of a crappy work situation. And that does funnel out to the rest of the customers. So how cool is this to like really get something to like allow you if you're starting off or if you are in a a current tap room to do a little bit of a, a deep clean assessment. Again, earmark this episode. There are links in the show notes to both Megan and Katie. Uh, work with them. They've, they've got a lot to offer, and I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, I know I certainly did. Yet another great workshop from the American Cider Association. So tip of the glass to that association for allowing me to share this with you today. This is listener-supported podcasting, so if you found value from this here podcast today, do consider becoming a patron of Cider Chat. You have two different ways to do that. You could hit the donate button at Cider Chat, or you could become a patron at the Cider Chat Patreon page. It's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Google Cider Chat and Patreon. And with that, I leave you here. This is Rhea Wincaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. We like cider. We like palms. We love orchards and having fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. We like cider. We 
like palms, we like orchards, having some fun. There is a reason, there is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh yeah. We, we like cider. Oh yes we do. We like palm. Oh yes we do. We love orchards, having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. We like walking down the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh, yeah. We like cider. We like palm. Oh, yes, we do. Like orchards, having some fun. Yeehaw!